thank you for joining in today's webinar on the topic of breaches and entry in a general tenancy. We have a large volume of attendees in today's session and that's over 800 attendees. So I understand your knowledge on this topic will vary from being quite advanced to or to be quite limited. My name is Lynn Smith. I'm a Senior Community Education Officer with the RTA. I've got over 30 years experience dealing with tenancy laws and situations between landlords and tenants. Welcome to today's webinar. In today's session, we will be covering the rules around entering a rental property, the timeframes for notices, compliance in relation to entry, the breach process including common breaches and timeframes, We'll also have a look at what to do next options when a breach is not rectified. And at the end, I will answer the questions that you have submitted during the session. You can submit questions by writing in the question box and sending them through. Just depending on the time, I will answer what I can answer at the end of the session. However, I do not address your question or your uh, matter is urgent, please contact our call centre on the 1300 366 311 number after the webinar is over. So just a reminder that the core business of the RTA is to administer the Act, which is the Residential Tenancies and Rooming Accommodation Act 2008. We provide tenancy information, manage bonds, offer a free dispute resolution service, uh, investigate breaches of the penalty provisions of the Act and also have a policy and education service. Our role is to provide information and services to all people involved in a tenancy across Queensland, whether you're the landlord, agent or a tenant. So the first part of today's webinar is going to be talking about the rules of entry. And just a quick reminder that all our RTA forms can be downloaded or ordered on the RTA's website. The Form 9's purpose is to inform the tenant of the entry by the lessor or agent or another authorised person. The form requires details of the person who is issuing the notice and also the person or people who are entering, their name and their contact phone number. <clears throat> Item 6 states the day, date and time of the entry. If it is the owner or manager that's entering, say for a routine inspection, you can nominate an actual time or you can nominate a two hour period of which the entry will occur. Note that the two hour window doesn't apply for tradespeople. The lessor agent can enter um, only between 8am and 6pm but cannot enter on a Sunday or a public holiday unless the tenant agrees. When it comes to time to serving the notice or issuing the notice, if the general tenancy agreement states that there's an agreement to serve by email, then you can do so. But otherwise, you're going to need to be the posting or hand delivering to the rental property. Remember, notices must be cleared days. So for example, if you're issuing a notice for routine inspection by post, you're going to have to allow the postal time as well as the seven days required in the Act. Remember to keep a copy of the notices that you've served and any documentation of any phone conversations or diary notes that may have taken place between yourself and the tenant, particularly if there is um, an agreed entry. So where do you find out more information about the rules of entry? Under the Act, sections 192 to 201 outlines the rules for entry, including reasons for entry, what notices is to be served, and the minimum time frame for issuing of notices and to when the entry can occur. I'm going to just pause for a moment and I'm going to launch a poll just to gauge the experience in today's um, session. So just bear with me. Today's poll is what is your level of knowledge on the entry rules? A, limited knowledge. B, know the times and reasons as listed in the entry notice. Um, C, your reasonable level of most areas of the legislation. Or D, strong knowledge of the legislation. And I'll just allow just a moment for everyone just to um, complete that poll. Great, thanks everyone. I'll just give you the outcome of today's poll just to let everyone know um, the experience that we have. 9% uh, said that they've got limited knowledge, 20% uh, sorry just bear with me, 20% um, say that they know the times and the reasons listed on the entry notice only, 
49% they said that they've got reasonable level of most areas of the legislation and 15% of strong knowledge of the legislation. So thanks everybody uh, for participating in that. So let's have a look at the reasons why you would want to enter a property and the notice period required to be given to a tenant. To inspect on a routine inspection, you need to give a minimum of seven days notice. You can enter at a specific time or enter within the two hour period. Just to give you the example, um, if I sent an entry notice and state that I'm entering between 9 and 11, the entry has to occur during this time. It doesn't state how long I can stay in the property. I could enter at 9 o'clock, I could still enter at 5 to 11, um, but I could not enter before 9 or after 11. For repairs and maintenance, um, or to check if a repair has been done, or to enter um, to comply with the smoke alarm and safety switch legislation, that requires a minimum of 24 hours notice. If you are showing a prospective purchaser or a tenant through the property, if it's up for sale or up for reletting, then a minimum of 24 hours notice is required. And if evaluation is to be done, again, 24 hours notice is required. If you have reasons to believe the property has been abandoned, then you can issue a notice um, with 24 hours notice to enter and check if it has been abandoned. If there has been a significant breach and you're going back to check that the breach has been rectified, that requires a minimum of 24 hours notice as well. While we'll be talking about a significant breach process um, shortly, so I'll leave that one um, a little bit longer. If the tenant agrees, then um, you can enter. It, it's um, done at a time that has been agreed between you and the tenant. We would recommend keeping some evidence that it was an agreed entry. Um, if there's an emergency or you believe on reasonable grounds that you need to enter to protect the premises, then you can enter and you do not require to give a minimum notice. Um, as an example of this, this would be like a storm damage or to secure the premises. It could be a burst pipe causing flooding to a lower floor apartment that needs to be addressed urgently. Um, if that's the case, obviously communicate with the tenant, let them know what's going on, but there's no minimum requirement you can actually enter. As a significant breach process contains entry and the breach process, I will outline the steps to follow for this process and, and what a significant breach is. So under section 192, um, section 2, um, outlines what a significant breach is. It is exceeding the number of occupants, uh, using the premises for an illegal purpose, uh, keeping a pet where pets were not allowed, or any other matter that if the reasonable cost to rectify it exceeds one week's rent. So can I just note that if you are doing an inspection and someone hasn't done the laundry or the dishes are not done and there's a bit of a mess there, it's not deemed to be a significant breach. So as an example, if you have issued your entry notice for routine inspection, you've provided the minimum of seven days notice plus any applicable serving time. When you do the inspection, if you find something that is that significant breach as I've mentioned earlier, you can issue a Form 11 breach notice requiring the tenant to rectify the situation within a minimum of period of seven days. If within the two weeks of the expiry of the date of the breach notice, you can actually enter by giving a minimum of 24 hours notice to see if the breach has been rectified. But as I said, that notice period must be done within the two weeks of the expiry of the breach notice. If the rental property is to be sold, the tenant needs to be informed of this in writing. And that's on a Form 10, Notice of Lessor's Intention to Sell. The form will also inform the tenant of the sales strategy and must be given to the tenant before any entry can occur to show a prospective purchaser. If the, uh, for an entry to occur to show per, um, prospective purchases, the tenant must be also issued a Form 9. If the renting agent and the selling agent are different, then it's a requirement for the selling agent to provide a copy of the Form 9 for each inspection for the renting agent unless it's been otherwise agreed. So the lessor agent must not allow a prospective purchaser to enter the premises without being accompanied by the lessor or the agent, and again, unless the tenant agrees. The tenant must agree to an, uh, in writing for an open house. Um, an open house cannot occur if they have not agreed. So section 203 has penalty provisions attached, and that's uh, 20 penalty units. I am going to talk about compliance shortly, so I will provide some um, cases on that as well. 
Tenant must agree in writing to use photos to advertise where it contains the tenant's possessions or belongings. And again, this particular section has penalty provisions as well. On a side note that um, if a property does go on the market for sale, that is the property is advertised and also the lessor agent shows prospective purchases through, if this process occurs within two months of a tenant moving in on a fixed term, the tenant can give two weeks notice and vacate without any penalty. Uh, this is under section 307. This does not apply if the tenant was advised prior to moving in or signing the agreement that the property was for sale. So I'm just going to have a look at some what if scenarios and questions we are quite often asked, including some that's actually been submitted today. So I think um, one of the uh, main ones that's come through has been in relation to if the tenant's not home and if the tenant refuses. So let's just have a look at those options. So the first one, if the tenant's not at home, the answer is if you have followed the rules in accordance to the Act and you've issued the required notice in the correct time frame, then you can enter even if the tenant's not there. If the tenant has changed locks, under the legislation, sections 210 to 213 talk about keys and locks, and more so if the locks have changed, the other party must um, be given a copy of the key. Um, so I'd refer you to these particular sections where the locks have been changed. If the tenant refuses, and this is sometimes that actually happens even through um, our dispute area, Communication and negotiation is going to be the key to resolving the situation. Firstly, finding out why. So asking questions as to why um, you know, you're being refused. Um, you know, there may be, the tenant may actually have a valid reason or a reasonable excuse. So for example, they might be having a family member that's ill or it's best that the tenant's home due to a pet being on the property. Then if that would be the case, then negotiating another day or time probably would be suitable. However, if you have someone flatly refusing constantly and you have showed them the act and the reasons why you can enter and you have correctly issued the notice, if you cannot communicate and negotiate another date or time, you can apply to the RTA's free dispute resolution service for assistance. Um, if it's not resolved, again, then after that you could also apply to the tribunal to gain entry. If you arrive um, and find other people living there that are not tenants, that are not the actual tenant on the agreement, firstly you're going to probably again ask questions to ascertain the situation. It could be that there um, is more than the approved occupants on the agreement, then this would be a breach. If it is the tenant has left without any notice and changed over to someone else, you would contact the tenant named on the agreement and confirm if they have left um, and end the agreement before you can actually start a new one. Um, you can also see whether or not it's a sublet situation and there are rules around subletting. If you've arrived at the property and it is abandoned and you have no doubt that there is evidence that they have gone, then you have two options. You can issue a Form 15, an abandonment notice to the property, giving seven days notice to end the tenancy, or you could apply for an urgent application to the tribunal on the grounds of abandonment. But I would say the best idea is to take photos as evidence and maybe speak with the neighbours. There are rules around abandonment and also um, more so in particular with any goods or documents that's left behind. It's really important that all parties involved in a tenancy to build and maintain the tenancy relationship to avoid disputes and keep those lines of communication open. Just like to take the opportunity just to bring attention to our compliance and investigations section of the RTA. Section 202 is unlawful entry of the premises. This states that the lessor or lesser agent must not enter the premises um, that must not enter the premises in contravention of the rules of entry. Um, and if the rules have been changed by the tribunal, that's also one of the other parts of the sections as outlined under 192 to 199. This section has penalty units attached um, and it also can be taken quite serious as an offence of the Act. I'll just share a couple of recent court cases with you where we have um, taken agents um, to the courts then because they have breached this section of the Act. So there is a lot of it, there is information about these particular cases on the RTA's website and I'd welcome you to view those particular stories. One agent was um, a Brisbane agent was fined in court for unlawful entry and one count of unlawful special terms um, in the agreement. The penalty was $10,000 and a criminal conviction was recorded. 
There was a North Queensland agency was fined two and a half thousand dollars for unlawful entry, plus a further six thousand dollars for unlawful special terms. So both of those stories, as I said, are available on the RTA's website under the newsroom section, and I'll welcome you to actually read those particular articles. With our investigations, if a complaint is substantiated by an RTA investigator, then we can either A, provide education uh, and issue a warning letter and just monitor the situation. We could also issue a penalty infringement notice known as a PIN. I guess this could be seen as uh, similar to like a speeding ticket. Uh, it's usually a smaller amount compared to a prosecution. Um, or we could commence a prosecution. With a prosecution, if you have breached the penalty provisions of the Act, and there are around 125 sections that have penalty provisions, the RTA can prosecute, and this matter is a criminal matter. It's taken before the Magistrate's Court. It's not a QCAT matter. So for real estate agents or companies, the director must be advised and the representative must have authority to bind the company. And the RTA would recommend that you seek your own independent legal advice. So whether that's being a penalty infringement notice that's been issued or if it is a prosecution and you've been notified. So I just want to talk about the second part of today's webinar, which is dealing with the remedy breach notice process. So just before I do continue, I will actually launch another poll. Um, just bear with me. So this poll, what we're looking at is what is the main reason you issue or receive breach notices? So the first one is rent arrears, noise complaints, unauthorised occupants or pets, repairs not being carried out or other. So I'll just give you a moment just to go through that um, poll. Great, thanks everybody. And just to give you an idea of the percentages, so we have today's 87% um, for rent arrears, 3 for noise, 4% for unauthorised occupants or pets, 1% for repairs not done, and 4% um, for other. Great. Thanks everybody. Well, we'll just keep going with um, the webinar on the remedy breach side of things. So what is a breach? A breach is a term of the standard or special term of a tenancy agreement and the breach can be done by either the tenant or by the lessor or the agent. I briefly outlined key sections of the legislation regarding breaches. Um, so section 280 states if the lessor agent believes on reasonable grounds the tenant has breached and the section 301 states if the tenant believes on reasonable grounds the lessor agent has breached. The breach must be in the approved form and must allow for the period to, of time to rectify the breach, uh, which in most situations in general tenancies will be seven days. The common types of breaches that we do see are rent arrears, uh, noise issues, uh, the breach by the tenant in interfering with reasonable peace, comfort and private um, of neighbours, and that's outlined under section 184. Unauthorised pets, unauthorised occupants, damage to rental premises, and the lessor agent not carrying out repairs and maintenance. With this topic, I would refer to the lessor's general obligations as outlined under section 185 of the Act, where it states that the lessor must ensure the premises and inclusions are clean, fit for the tent to live in, and good repair and not in breach of any health or safety laws. This section then continues to say that while the tenancy continues, the lessor must maintain the premises and inclusions in good repair. So when the breach has occurred, you can issue a Form 11, a Notice to Remedy Breach. For this example, I've chosen a rent arrears process. So if the tenant has fallen seven days behind in rent, uh, on the eighth day you can issue a breach, giving the tenant a minimum of seven days to rectify the breach. In the slide you'll see in item 5, it's important that you complete this as to the date the rent is paid to, the number of days rent is overdue, and this is as of the day the serving of the notice, and the amount due. This amount is the amount that is due at the time of serving the notice, not rent that's going to be due during the period of the breach. 
On this notice, you'll also see the method of, of issue. So whether that's by email, post or in person, remember notices are clear days and if you're posting a notice, refer to Australia Post website for their posting times relevant to the type of posting and the area um, because you will need to add that time frame to the notice. So when posting, you may find that again, depending on the type of posting you are adding, you may need to add an extra two to six business days. If you are serving notices by email, ensure that you have an agreement on the tenancy agreement and that the box is ticked along with the email address for serving. We have been asked, can I send it by um, a scanned text message by phone? Text messaging is not an approved method of serving. You must serve by an approved method, which is your email, post or in person. We know some people will send a reminder by text that they've served a notice, but that is not the original source of service. And that probably answers quite a few questions that's um, come in today's session as well. Section 299 and 315 outline the repeated breach process. So section 299 if the tenant has breached and 315 for the lessor if they have breached. If two breach notices have been issued and a third breach occurs within 12 months, then you can apply for an urgent application direct to QCAT, the tribunal, to terminate the tenancy on the grounds of repeated breaches. It must be for the same breach and on each occasion the breach the previous breaches have to be rectified in full and it is recommended to read these sections and look at the seriousness of the breaches as well. To provide you with an example, so if a tenant did not pay rent and the rent breach process was followed where the tenant rectified the payment required within the time frame, this has occurred twice and then on the third occasion the tenant falls behind in rent, you can apply directly to the tribunal, no notices are actually issued. Uh, if a tenant had a party one weekend and caused neighbourhood disturbances, the breach is issued, they don't party within that seven day time frame, that means that the breach has been rectified. If this happens twice, and as said, both times have been rectified, on the third occasion, again, you could apply directly to the tribunal. No notices have been issued directly to the tenant on that third time. Again, the RTA recommends communication between lesser agents and tenants and making sure that everybody understands their rights and responsibilities under the legislation. So if the breach is rectified, obviously the, no further action is required nor no further action is going to be taken. If it's not rectified, there's options available. So what to do next? Communication, as I said before, with the tenant and discuss options um, or if it's a lessor's breach, tenant to communicate with them. If the outcome is in relation to a payment plan or any other agreement, say a compensation amount, then put that agreement in writing and everyone has to sign it. Um, it could also be that there's an agreement for something to be fixed by due date. Again, put that in writing and everyone signs it. It is also known that there's some community organisations out there that will offer assistance to help tenants sustain their tenancy and um, get involved financially. These organisations vary and also depends on um, the locations. So tenants could also refer to their uh, local Rent Connect officer, which is through the Department of Housing and Public Works for assistance. If the next step is to end the agreement, you may issue a notice to leave or a notice of intention to leave. I've listed the um, sections to follow. As an example, um, if, I, if it is that you fail to rectify a remedy breach and then it is, seven, it is then seven days notice to leave, if it is for any other breach, it's a 14 days notice to leave. So if the tenant does not leave, then you would then be applying to QCAT, the tribunal for a termination order and a warrant of possession. There are rules in how a tenancy can end and must be in compliance with the legislation. So for that I'm going to refer you to section 353 which states ways of recovering um, possession of the premises. If you take back possession other than a way that's authorised in the Act, there is penalty provisions attached to that section. If you cannot resolve the matter, you can also apply for, for assistance through the RTA's free dispute resolution service. As said, there are some options that are available depending on the situation and the type and the seriousness of the breach, um, what action you may require to take. So when it comes to dispute re resolving disputes, the RTA recommends three steps to resolving tenancy matters. 
Self-resolution, communicating and trying to resolve the matter yourself directly with the other person. Applying to the RTA's free dispute resolution service by completing and signing a Form 16 dispute resolution request. The RTA will then view the dispute and see if parties will participate in a conciliation process. It is a voluntary process, so we cannot force parties to participate. However, we will encourage it. We then can organise a telephone conference with the other party involved and try and resolve the matter. The role of the conciliator is impartial and they're not there to take sides. The decision of the outcome belongs to the parties who are actually involved in the dispute. If it's not resolved, then it can progress to the tribunal for an outcome. It's, if the matter is an urgent matter as outlined under Section 415, you can go straight off to QCAT, the tribunal. All other matters deemed non-urgent as outlined under Section 416 must go through our dispute resolution process first. And you know, keep in mind that if it's not resolved through the dispute process, some of the notices when applying to the tribunal may be time sensitive with their application. Just one comment I will add um, is what um, is when it comes to serving any notices to remember to ensure that you have followed the correct rules and timeframes. If matters proceed to a tribunal, the areas that you need to be mindful of is that if you have allowed the right amount of notice, particularly with breaches and any notices issued, that you have allowed clear days and you can demonstrate how that notice was served. So if you are hand delivering to the letterbox, then you would want to put down the date and time of delivering the notice and maybe even consider a photo of delivery as evidence or a stat deck. Only serve by email if the tenancy agreement is ticked um, to agree to have the notices served that way and list the email address for service on the agreement. If you're issuing by mail that you have followed the correct mail time, remember to refer to the Australia Post website and look at whether you're sending it by express, priority or normal mail. Remember, you cannot issue another notice or take action until the expiry of the date of the notice, and that is that time is actually going to be midnight. So if a notice to remedy breach expires on the 1st of June, you cannot issue a notice to leave or take action until the 2nd of June. For any other tense information, contact the RTA, our 1300 366 311 number, and talk to our client service team or you can go to the RTA's website. We have a lot of information there, resources, videos, um, publications, and all our forms are available as well. Um, you can order the entry and the breach notices from the RTA's website or give us a call and we can send them out to you. Look, we've got a lot of questions that's come through today um, and I'm just going to take some time now just to quickly answer some of those questions. And I'm just a bit conscious of the time as well. So. Um, we have covered a lot in today's um, topic and I know that some of the questions that have come through, I have actually addressed that with some of the content. So one of the questions is just clarification on giving notice to a tenant when a property is sold and it's coming to the end of the fixed term. Is four weeks still okay? The quick answer is actually no. Um, two months notice without grounds to end a fixed term. The four weeks notice period is only applicable on a periodic tenancy. So the tenant has to be on a periodic tenancy to um, issue because on the grounds that the property has been sold. If the tenant is on a fixed term, uh, it's coming to the end of the fixed term, it's going to be two months notice without grounds. Um, if the, as I said, when the property has been sold, the four weeks only apply when it's a periodic tenancy. If you issue a breach with seven days to rectify damage and you know it's going to take them longer, do you just add more time? Look, the legislation outlines seven days is the minimum. This does not stop you from giving a tenant more time on the breach notice. So you may choose 10 days or 20 days. The legislation only outlines the minimum time frames. Just another question here, is there a time frame that you have to issue a notice to leave after a breach expires? In the legislation, there's actually not, uh, it's not listed. There is um, no time frame in between the two notices. However, it would need to be issued within a reasonable time. Um, what would that be? Um, could it be the next day or within a week? Possibly yes. If it's in a month's time or longer, then that possibly may not be reasonable. It really comes down to the seriousness of the breach. However, I will point out that there's a time frame, however, from when you issue a notice to leave, when that's expired, to when you have to apply to the tribunal, 
then that's a two week time frame. So that's really important to understand that. If you intend to apply to the tribunal, uh, you need to ensure that that's done within that two week time frame. Otherwise, the tribunal may choose to dismiss your case and you'll have to start again. Um, look, thanks everyone for your questions. Um, as I said, if I haven't had a chance to answer them, please again contact our 1300 number um, and those I will try and see if I can address them um, personally after the um, session. Quick uh, three question surveys now are just going to pop up and if you could just stay online and answer those quick questions. We're looking to know what sort of topics you're interested to know about, um, you know, which will actually help us tailor some future webinars. Thank you again, everybody, for your attendance and thank you again for completing those polls for us. Uh, the webinar will now end.